Okay, so uh, welcome back again uh, to the third lecture, I guess. Uh, so this lecture is going to be slightly different. Uh, in the last two lectures, I kind of gave you some backgrounds on the modeling issues, the grids, uh, boundary conditions, and few practical aspects of how you do set up problems. Today, I'm going to talk about actually a subgrid approach that attempts to understand whether we can track in the features that we discussed in the last couple of classes. And uh, uh, this is based on the work we have done and it's a, I'll go through it step by step for the whole lecture actually and along with showing some results in order to highlight what it, what it is trying to do, you know. Uh, it's called the linearity model but I'll get to that but uh, uh, it's essentially the idea is to look at the multi-scale nature of combustion, turbulent combustion. As you know, Turbulence already has a bunch of scales. Combustion also has a bunch of scales, you know, and typically combustion occurs at scales in LES which you cannot resolve. You, know, you cannot have the grid to resolve the flame structure in a typical LES. So how do you bring in what you cannot resolve in a way that you can actually predict the structure accurately without, without making too many assumptions? And that's one of the challenges for subgrid modeling, you know. Uh, one of the reasons I am going through is on or off, yes. uh, one of the reasons I am going through the steps is that I have given a set of code for this problem, uh, uh, for this modeling approach. It is not the full LES codes obviously, but it is the models, the codes for the models and the codes are available in a folder in the upload and it was also based on what we presented earlier in the AAA courses. Uh, these are Fortran codes and there are some slides in here where I will be kind of quickly going through the slides to explain a little bit. But the, all the reason the code, the slides are there is because it, it points to the code. It tells you what the code looks like and what the variables are just as like a documentation, you know. So I may not cover all the slide that has the documentation, but what I will try to explain is what is the nature of that, uh, this model. So just to, before I get there, I wanted to repeat this, uh, that these are the classical models that are out there. I mean, that there may be some more, but essentially they are variants of that. Things like uh, eddy breakup, eddy dissipation, partially stirred reactors uh, uh, are models that are very simplistic. Basically, you could call it like a one equation model, but it uses some closure assumptions uh, that are questionable when you are de dealing with multi-step chemistry. Like AD breakup especially has problems with multi-step chemistry. If you are doing one step global chemistry, it is okay. Partially stirred reactor can deal with multi-step chemistry, but it still needs a flame wrinkling modeling. Thickened flame is originally designed for a one step chemistry even though they have claimed to have used it for multi step. Uh, but uh, uh, the main focus in all of these is that we are trying to tackle finite rate chemistry and its interaction with turbulence. That is the goal. But the point is how they go about doing that is very different. You know? So in these things are simplified. This one you thicken the flame and you adjust the flame speed and the diffusion so that it propagates correctly. You have a thick flame propagating like a thin flame. It allows you to do it early years and I will show some results of that today. Flamelets, you have, you are familiar, it is based on a mixture fraction formulation and all the chemistry is offline. In other words, it is all a table and the primary assumption is that a mixture fraction represents the chemistry. Now that is a valid assumption if you are in pure flamelet regimes is valid assumption in the premix, but the same approach will not work for non premix. So flamelets have assumptions that are built in that are important and for example, there is really no way to deal with differential diffusion because the mixture fraction is just a Lewis number one model. Even if you have tabulated the chemistry with detailed diffusion, the, the mixture fraction that you are tracking is has a limitation. Now to do LES with flamelets, you, ha you have to solve for mixture fraction, uh, maybe the variance of mixture fraction and, and then you have a massive assumption on the scalar dissipation. You know that is like a model, you have to put a model for scalar dissipation which is basically not known for the mixture fraction and that is a typical a big problem in there. You know. 
conditional moment closures and PDFs. Conditional moment closure essentially is a like a flamelet, except it is conditioned at the uh, the flame surface. There are it works for a small number of dimensions. If you go to larger dimensions, it becomes very expensive. The details were in the yesterday's lecture, so I'm not covering them. PDF methods deal with chemistry in an exact sense, but cannot deal with molecular mixing. And it assumes that everything is controlled by trivial mixing. You know, so again, it has some limitations. And the number of particles, the PDF to get a good PDF, you have to run a lot of particles, and that can become very expensive. Uh, uh, one-dimensional turbulence, that's a turbulence-based model that is kind of, I'm not going to cover it. And then there's a linear ready model that we've been developing over the past four years. So how do, what, what, do we, what do we mean by turbulent closure for turbulent combustion? If you look at the LES equations, essentially the first three are the classical equations. If you don't have combustion, you still have them. Yeah. And, and even if you, and the last one is the species equation. This was written in the LES format. You can see that is a, written consistently in that form. So uh, the question then becomes is that if you did it like this, you need to model these three quantities. But that's not straight. That's not even correct because this is assuming that the mixture fraction is filtered, right? I mean, this tilde implies the grid is, uh, it is resolved on the LES grid. So you're talking about a mixture fraction variable, or, or uh, sorry, not mixture, for mass fraction or mole fraction or whatever species density that is resolved at the LES grid. Now, LES grid is supposed to be coarse. You know, if, you, if you're not doing a DNS, you're doing an LES, so the grid is always coarse, so you're going to lose a lot of information. So, but you're still saying mass is conserved at that scale based on these so-called subgrid terms where, in fact, the mass fraction actually evolves at the subgrid scale. Reactions are occurring at the small scale. Mixing is occurring at the small scales. Molecular diffusion is occurring at the small scale. So all these terms, including these terms that, you're, that one could assume is resolved at the LES level, are stri strictly do not exist at the LES level they, from a physics point of view. Mathematically and modeling point that, you know, people, all the models I've talked about except linear eddy basically solve these equations, you know. So, so they, so all those other models end up having to decide how to model these terms and also sometimes how to model the diffusion velocity. So uh, the point is that if you did it this way, that's one way. There's a whole series of models like that. If you replace the mixture fraction, that's a mixture fraction equation. Uh, progress variable will have something else. And, uh, but they're all making the assumption that even if combustion is at the unresolved scales, we can model it, everything in the resolved scale. That's enough. Now, op the, it is opposite of this approach for fluid mechanics where we say uh, everything is resolved and we'll model the small scale as an AD viscosity, which makes sense, I guess, because molecular diffusion, uh, 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 dissipation occurs at the small scale. So uh, nothing much action in turbulence, nothing much happens at the small scale other than dissipation. Maybe there's some turbulent mixing. Uh, so the AD viscosity concepts here makes sense if you use the AD diffusivity concepts for some of these terms, terms like this, in strictly speaking, it's not valid because you're talking about diffusion at the large scale, uh, uh, model at the large scales for something that is occurring in the small scale. The other point is that, uh, and this may not be appreciated very well, that uh, when we deal with AD viscosity models in, in fluid mechanics, uh, we use a Magronsky or you know, whatever model we're using, that's an isotropic model, right? And because it doesn't have, it is like a scalar. So that means, and that's okay because small scales are supposed to be isotropic in turbulence. But if you have reactions and flame structures and mixed species forming and disappearing, the subgrids, the small scale fluctuations on the scalar fields are not isotropic. Right? I mean, you have a oxygen, hydrogen, then suddenly you have a reaction and you get water or OH and they're, they're falling spikes. So you get a lot of anisotropy in scalar gradients at the subgrid level. So if you use the AD viscosity, AD diffusivity closure, that's wrong already. You know? It still is used. I mean, you'll see it, everybody using it. But what I'm pointing out is that just because it is used is not, doesn't make it right. You know? and, and just because it doesn't seem to give you any trouble, uh, it's probably because you're not running, to, trying the real problem. You know, sometimes. So the assumptions that go into closing this 
if you follow the logic here and go here, that's basically all flawed. That's the that's typically the uh, point here. So, for example, typical strategy for the species would be well, if you have a finite volume solver, uh, as many people do, fluid mechanics, you just add some more species to it and use the same flux routines, uh, flux split or uh, a compact scheme or whatever scheme you are using, you solve that equation on that grid with the same accuracy and the same time step. You know, but reality is that if kinetics is imposed, by definition kinetic time scales are much smaller, so you may need to have a different time step. So you will have to do sub iterations or implicit schemes or preconditioning, a bunch of other options have to be brought in. And, uh, the other point is that now you have this other issue which I am sure if you are doing combustion, you know mass is conserved that means the mass fraction should sum up to 1, right. And there should be net, no net diffusion between the species so the, uh, and there should be obviously net, no net production and destruction. So if you use the same scheme that you use for fluid mechanics, there is a good chance that you sum up, you will get negative mass fraction. You know, I mean if you have done that you will know that, you know. So what do you do? There is nothing like negative mass fraction. So if you set it to 0, you have violated mass conservation and people do that and can we all do that. We you do not put it to 0, maybe we re reshuffle the thing so that the summation adds up to 1. So but that test has to be done at every time step, you know. And, and if you are doing a second order scheme and you have finite rate chemistry with you know, 300 degree Kelvin fuel air mixture and 2700 degree flame occurring over one grid point you are bound to have oscillation, you, know, you can't capture that unless the grid is very fine. So again you are coming back to the point that the flame is so thin that the, you cannot resolve it at any at the grid and if you try to resolve it you have to you know you will have to put so much of a grid points that combustion will essentially force you to have a DNS type resolution you know, which is what you do not want to do. You know. so, uh, so these restrictions are necessary and sometimes this becomes worse because of the accuracy of the scheme uh, like the schemes we talked about in the past. So, but given that second to fourth order schemes are pretty much the best compromise in accuracy and cost, uh, this issue will always come. You know. so, but this is still uh, on top of the issues that small scales are not being resolved in, in a typical LES. We do not we don't have any information of anything uh, below the LES grid. You know. So the question is, can we get that information? Is there a way to avoid this problem as much as possible but not doing exactly like that? That in other words, we do not we don't want to solve this equation like this. Let us say is there a way, any other way to solve this equation without following the strategy for fluid mechanics? Which is a valid thing because there is no reason why species should be solved just the way the fluid mechanics are because their physics requirements are different. So, uh, uh, so I've already repeated that. Uh, the, the point here is that if the grid is big, coarse, and we are forcing it to be coarse to some extent, uh, the flames cannot be resolved. If you thicken the flame to resolve it, you're making approximation. That's a thickened flame approach. I mean, it still works, but you have to be careful. The other point is that uh, in LES, we talk about large scales are resolved and the small scales are modeled. Uh, but if the grid is coarse, you have a lot of small scales, maybe isotropic scales, but you have a bunch of scales. Those scales are also going to wrinkle the flame. You cannot have this wrinkling of flame uh, mixing, uh, flame structures being affected only by or even mixing uh, only by the large scale. The small scales also have to mix. So now you have two types of mixing. You have a mixing at the large scales and I will explain it further and mixing at the small scale, just the turbulence side of it. Then you have to add to that molecular mixing. So the point is that turbulent mixing and molecular mixings are two different things, completely two different physics. You know. And most models at K epsilon, all the models you have, everybody has seen is basically models for turbulent mixing because there are no real models for molecular mixing. You know, there's molecular mixing is molecular mixing. You know, you got to deal with it. You know. Uh, so, uh, so these two have to be held together. One is a purely a fluid mechanical effect. If the Reynolds number is low and there is not that many small scales, there is not much, much going on in the small scales. If the Reynolds number is high and the grid is coarse, there is a lot of turbulent mixing going on. You know. So, so your, your model must adjust 
not only to the fact that you have turbulent mixing and molecular diffusion, it should adjust to your grid resolution. If the grid is changed, you can test the model, right? You, you, the model should automatically adjust to the changes in the grid because if you, every time you change the grid, you have to tweak the model, you're done. You're wasting your point, wasting your time, you know. And most of the other models, they are actually are adjusting it because the coefficients are tuned. You know, the, the coefficients and diffusion coefficients and those coefficients are always tuned. So, uh, like I said, I also said that the conventional models essentially ignore uh, molecular diffusion because their assumption is turbulence is taking over. So, turbulent mixing is sufficient. Now, that's immediately somebody could ask, well, what if you have differential diffusion? Like let's say you have hydrogen and methane in a mixture, which happens all the time. Uh, hydrogen diffuses 10 times faster, you know, or Lewis number effects. How can you get Lewis number effects if you have a turbulence model that only deals with turbulent mixing? Because there is not, nothing uh, Lewis number in the turbulent closure for turbulent mixing. You cannot handle that. So Lewis number one versus Lewis number 10 or 100 makes no difference. The turbulent mixing model will not be sensitive to that. Yet we know from experiments, hydrogen will diffuse faster. You will get multi hydrogen flames will be different from a methane flame in a mixture. So a lot of the flamelet type models, even though they hide the diffusion in the flamelet library, the mixer fraction, that's why I was saying, doesn't know anything about that you know, in the actual solving. So, so the question is, can we deal with these issues? So, uh, so we want to look at it from a physics point first. So this is basically what I said, it is a multi-scale problem and there are obviously some things that are occurring at the LES resolve scales and that could be the transport of scalars by the large eddies. The large eddies are moving things back and forth like vortex roll up and, and that, that has to be resolved on the large scale because it's already, it's big enough that it is resolved. Then you are mixing by the large scales because you're, the vortex is rolling up, the interfacial area is increasing so that means it's you are producing more and more mixing zones and then you have small scales will also have small eddies like you know in the classical turbulence statement large eddies go to small eddies all the way to viscosity you know and so that's like classical Richardson statement about a cascade you know large eddies break down to small scales so you have smaller eddies you create more interfacial areas more turbulent mixing but then once that mixing has happened uh, then you have to have molecular diffusion which is the diffusion process that will now occur along with the eddies that are below the cutoff. And then only then can you have combustion. Only when species are mixed at the molecular scales, you have combustion. Now, you know, the models say, okay, we don't care about diffusion. If A and B are present in a cell, it's going to react and produce C, you know. But the point is that if, even if A and B are physically present in a cell, like half of it is A and half of it is B, it doesn't mean they're mixed yet. You know, that mixing might take some time, which is independent of the time scales that you're running for the LES. You might be taking a large time step, you know, but the time, mixing time might, might, can be much shorter. And it's only when you have reaction, you have heat release. And again, the physics says heat release should occur at the small scales, because that's where the reactions are. But heat, re heat release is volumetric. You know, it's all, it's heat release going in all directions. You can't force the heat release unless you have designs to go in one direction. So heat release is volumetric, so essentially it feeds back to the large scales from the small scales back. So when heat release goes up, temperature goes up, viscosity goes up, Reynolds numbers decrease, and then basically it starts affecting the energy cascade of the turbulence. Small eddies start to disappear, and, and then the energy goes back, and that affects the velocity field, which then couples back to this process again. So that's the coupling that occurs uh, in that. So that's really what the linear eddy model that I was talking about is trying to do. So essentially, it attempts to separate the problem into a two-step process. So that's the main thing. It, 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 and it's an Eulerian Lagrangian. So in the subgrid, it says that it has to deal with molecular mixing, subgrid eddy turbulence, reaction kinetics, and volumetric expansion. And then once it expands, the large scale transport, the convective transport, which is the, the, the deriv the, I'll show you the equation in a minute, um, is then handled as a separate Lagrangian transport. So un unlike the conventional finite volume schemes, this is not done in a 
in an Eulerian approach is done as an Eulerian Lagrangian approach. And so, so there are advantages and there are disadvantages and I will talk about that in a minute. Uh, but conceptually what you can think about this is it is a grid within a grid concept. So the idea is let us say this is your DNS grid, let us say the finest grid you can take. In which case you can get the structure of the flame, uh, wrinkle flame is all resolved and there is no problem. But you want to do an LES, that means your grid has to be larger, orders of maybe factor of 8 or factor of 16 larger than this cell. So if this is the real flame, you can see from this picture, even though I have drawn the same flame here, you cannot actually see that. This structure inside the cell is not known in LES. You all you get is a single point, one point, right? Just like here you have one point, but except that the points are so close together, you can build a structure. So in the LES point region, if you were doing a conventional finite volume, you will just get a few points. So basically you will get a point here, a point here, a point here, a point here, and the structure will be completely wiped out. So what linearity tries to do is that it embeds a locally one dimensional grid and it's not, it does not line up like that, I'll, that's why I am showing it there, I will get to that in a minute, uh, where we try to resolve the, it goes, it, that grid is so fine that you can resolve down to the Kolmogorov scale and you do the reaction diffusion and uh, volumetric heat release at the small scale. The main, you know, the, the 1D is an approximation because if, if this grid was a 3D grid, then you are back to DNS, right, then there is no point. So, so how can you do it in a 1D problem? Well, you cannot, it, it cannot be a physical 1D, it cannot be lined up because just like the way I have shown, because the flame is changing every time step, right, you do not know what the flame looks like. So the line actually is, a, is, the line is not a line, it is basically a line lined up normal to the flame, flame not gradient, flame normal, it is like a flame normal, just like the mixture fraction space if you think about it, uh, mixture fraction space is designed as a flame normal or a scalar gradient, so at every time step this line is changing shape, changing. You can see here the flame is wrinkling by 180, bigger 80 and the line is actually trying to track the flame crossings. That means in this particular case you have one, two, three, three flame crossings and another two crossings here. So you can tell you that the, uh, if you can think about that as a perfect uh, uh, circle, then the distance between the two flame crossings is the radius of curvature, right? So if you know the distance between two flame points, you, you know there is a flame here and a flame here and it is all products here, you know that is a curvature. So you know the length of the flame just by the flame crossings. And that is typically used in experiments, by the way, those who do experiments, uh, uh, PLIF images essentially can give you flame crossings too. And then you can recover the structure on that line. Uh, whatever we want. So the idea here is that LES grid is coarse, you only resolve the large scales, but instead of getting a single point there, you build this point on this line over time because this is now at a much finer time scales. Then you average that and you feed that back to the large scales. So the species equations do not exist in with the fluid mechanics equation. This linearity model essentially gives you the full species formulation. Uh, and, and it is because it is based on the concept, the physics I just mentioned, it is what, I, what we call a regime independent model. That means it does not even know what it is solving for. You know, it is just solving, you, know, if you give it whatever it is, either it is premix, non premix, partially premix, spray, it, 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 does, it does whatever it wants. It has some approximations like 1D and a few other things. Uh, uh, and one of the important point here is that. Uh, most models that I just mentioned earlier, uh, flamelet, PDFs, CMC, if you read the literature, you will realize that those, all those models are RANS models. They are not LES models. Everything, every, all the models that are in existence started as RANS models and then they changed the grid size to the filter and became an LES model. So the history of those models come from the RANS side of it. So it brings the baggage, RANS baggage with it, you know, when you go to LES. LEM LES is a purely an LES model. It cannot do RAM because it is doing turbulent mixing and, so, and resolving. And it actually works better, higher the Reynolds number it is. Well, most other models, if you are read the literature, they look great at near laminar flows. But as you go to turbulent flows, very high turbulence, you get, start getting errors and you have mixing errors and 
so this is the it has an opposite of that uh, and so it is it is well suited for what we call statistically stationary flames that means the flames that are just sitting and burning like that if, if the flame is just moving like one point to the other point then it, it won't but like a Bunsen burner jet flames rear facing state those are all statistically stationary flames that means the flames are anchored they're staying there they're wrinkling and they're fluctuating but they're not flying off the surface you know so this this model is mostly suited for this kind of problems and it's also suited for high runoff from the floor so it actually so by definition what it means is it doesn't really work for laminar flows you can see that with the way it is implemented that it assumes there is turbulence in the subgrid. It wants turbulence in the subgrid. It wants to, to know, to, the model gets more accurate if there are more and more turbulence in the subgrid that is not being uh, resolved. And what I will show you as an example through the next few lectures, it is essentially the same model without any adjustment. In fact, no adjustable parameters, has no adjustable coefficient. In other words, to, uh, the model was built back in the 90s. And since 2005 or something, we haven't touched the model. And we've been still using it for different flows, you know. And it's a dynamic model, so it keeps changing. Each mo model behaves differently in different flows, but it allows you to apply it to all combustion regimes. But there are price, you know, obviously nothing is for free. It's expensive. But you'll also see that because these 1D lines are embedded in the LES grid, it is suited for parallel computing. It is trivially parallel. Basically, you're calling something inside every grid. So. So you have to use parallel computing and more sophisticated methods. And then there are some things that, uh, uh, like for example, I, like I'm talking about curvature effects and scenario when compressive strain has similar magnitudes in different directions. That means if the flame is not wrinkling in one direction but is going completely crazy, that 1D line will not know which one to pick. It'll just pick one direction. So it has an approximation. So that has problems when you have very tiny spherical flames which may not be happening. Then the large scale molecular diffusion is ignored because the molecular diffusion is only handled at the subgrid. So this, this has some implications uh, and I will, you know, obviously that means that if you take this model and try to run laminar problems, you run into trouble. You go to very high turbulent problems, it goes, it will become very accurate, you know. So it is the opposite of other models. Other models run greatly and laminar, this one does, not you know. So those are some of the, but these are well known based on the approximation. So how do we do this? Let us let's go through the steps a little bit. Uh, and I want you to think about this large scale, small scale physics that I mentioned. So here is a species equation. This is a, there is no bar in here. So this is the exact. Think about this as a DNS equation. So let us say if I said I want to do the DNS of the species and LES of the fluid mechanics. So that's conceptually that's what we are trying to do. So you have the convection term, you have the diffusion kinetic source term. If you have a spray vaporization, that also can be added there. And I'm also saying there is large scale turbulence and small scale turbulence. So we can say then the large scale or the resolved scale contains the filtered value that we are solving for in the LES equation. And some fluctuation that you're resolving at the of the subgrid, the kinetic energy, like a KSTS model that I mentioned, because that is the turbulence that is being resolved at the resolved scales from the missing turbulence. So that's the resolved part. And then there is some unresolved turbulence we have no clue about. That's the thing that we are we have no way to find out. But it exists. And for fluid mechanics, we don't care because everything everything is subsumed by the closures of use. U prime STS, which is based on KSTS model. But like I said, for combustion, that's important because that term is affecting turbulent mixing at the small scale. So what we do is that we break it up into two step process. This is like a, I'm just showing an algorithm. You take the N is the previous time, this is the intermediate time. So we take in a time step where we solve just this part. Uh, and uh, uh, and the diff so we are solving the, the small scale convection, the, the molecular diffusion, chemical source and reaction. So these are all the processes that are occurring in the subgrid. These are all happening in the grid inside the LES grid. And then once you have in the same token, we are also moving the scalar field by the convection of the large scale. This is now large scale resolved. So we, are, we now have a two step process. 
you haven't done anything yet. If you look at this equation, you sum it up, you get that, and essentially in the end you basically have not, you know, the cost is still expensive. Because this has to be in 3D, because this is a 3D problem. This is where we, we have to make a reduction. If this was also 3D, then you're back to DNS type of headaches, and you don't want to do that. So we are try what we are trying to do then is that we are now going to have to create a model here. That's the, of course, that's the model that I was mentioning. That's the linearity model, and that we have to deal with that. Now, if you're doing reaction here, those of you who have done combustion know that you can do reaction without temperature, energy equation, right? You have to have, any, if you are familiar with Chemkin or something, then you have reaction and reaction diffusion is also has. There's an energy equation for temperature. Otherwise, the chemistry won't evolve. So you, you have to have a form of the chemistry in energy equation also in the subgrid. So here is another approximation. This is a model where you get two values of temperature because you're solving the energy equation at the LES level, so you get a temperature from that, and you solve for a temperature equation in the subgrid only for the subgrid processes. So you get another temperature. And the difference is, for example, if you look at this, this looks like the full temperature equation again, but we break it up again into two-step process, and and then once we model this in 1D, uh, this this equation essentially loses out loses uh, things like viscous work and pressure work. Now, so it cannot handle the the 1D equation, the energy equation in the subgrid doesn't handle that. But if you're familiar with Chemkin, Chemkin essentially uses the same 1D model. Uh, you have a species equation and your energy equation, which is basically, uh, if you're done, uh, I don't know, if chem you guys, someone, somebody said you don't have chemkin here, do you? No. But you know, uh, reaction like obdiff, you know, premix 1D problems, you know, cap classical 1D problems in chemkin, basically you show the energy equation and species equation. So the energy equation here is exactly that, except for the fact, the only difference is that if you take out this term, from the species energy equation, and you take out uh, this term from the species equation, it goes back to the Chemkin package. So it's basically the Chemkin model, but with a with a fix because the way it is designed designed is in the flame normal direction. So that's the main point. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, only in the subgrid. Yes. It is, it, is, it is changing at every instant, and I'll show you that, you know, because this, this, this turbulent mixing is making the, the line adjust. So the line is always in the direction of the flame normal or, or in the gradient direction. So every time there is a gray, the, the stirring actually makes the thing change. So it's not a physical line. It's a one-dimensional space. It's an it's a arbitrary space that is moving. You can imagine this as what if you are taking a plif and you're taking line images bang, 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 you know, every time the flame changes, you get the line image. That's basically what you're doing. You're, you're building statistics by taking this 1D line images of a subgrid structure, and how the structure is evolving in, in three, dim three dimension is basically from this part, which is fully 3D, you know, but this part is, this part mimics the effect of 3D on the small scale. So, and only works again because the turbulence is considered isotropic, right? If it has turbulence, so the scalar field doesn't have to be isotropic, but the eddies are isotropic. So small, small eddies are, if this is an eddy here, another eddy there, they all look the same. They might be different in size, uh, but they're about, they're all, they're isotropic eddies. So the lines can then recover the gradients in the flame normal direction. I'll show you some more details uh, as we go further. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'll show that, but in the, the problem, like I said, the difference between this, they, they should not be very different because the only thing missing in the subgrid is the viscous work and pressure work. Only this, these terms are missing, you know. So, uh, so I, I, actually one of the ways to keep an eye on that is to, you got to make sure that every time step that you start the chemistry in the subgrid based on the resolved time energy. Because this is a local, the subgrid time is local. It, we are not really pick, keeping it forever because you're, every time step it is evolving up to the next LES time, and then you get a new set and it evolves to the next LES. So you, you reset the temperature so that it's always starting at the LES time step. So that way, that way the global energy is always conserved. 
but species conservation is coming between by adding these two processes. Yeah, but the temperature like I said that is why I said there are two temperatures that temp this temperature that you are getting from this process uh, uh, is only tracked to, to allow you to do the reaction. It is only for the reaction. If there is no reaction you do not need the temperature. You know. Yeah, yeah. In other words, you plot the LES temperature. If you if you go to the, uh, if you plot the, because you are solving these equations also, right? You get temperature from this. That's the that's the temperature that the whole field is seeing. The subgrid is seeing another temperature only because you want to do the reactions. You know, so that's why it, it is not this form. You you don't have this term. You don't have this term. You know, and uh, but so. The, but the, those two temperatures should be very close to each other like 10, 20 degree Kelvin apart. If they go widely apart something has gone wrong you know. And but in order to make it conserve every, every LES time once you get this temperature you initialize the start the temperature you, you set the reset the temperature on the subgrid before you evolve it. So that the reactions are coupled to this because if when you are solving these equations if you look at it these equations where does species come in? Species really do not come in directly. It only comes in inside the mixture uh, species enthalpies and maybe in the equation of state. So species really do not come into the fluid mechanics equations directly. You know, it is just like but on the other hand the velocity field comes in directly in the species equation. You know, so if, if, if unless it is all and species definition is hidden here and hidden in the pressure that is about the only places it shows up. So all you need is a filter species information to close that thing you know. So the idea here is that this is a model that will give you this term it feeds it that term back from the subgrid what the combination of the model and then those equations are closed. So that is why I am giving you those curves because in theory you can take a non-reacting solver and add the LEM model to it and make it reacting. Huh? Yeah, it, it is evolving at every LES time step. So the flow field evolves at the LES time step, and the subgrid, uh, the species evolves. See, you can see here this this internal 1D in, inner process is only evolving up to one delta t. Then it evolves again, evolves again. So it's it's coupled. So the flow chart may look like this. Here's the LES solver. This is a classical mass momentum energy fluid mechanics solver. If you are not solving LEM you solve the species along with that not, no difference right. If it is LEM you go in here and you have two steps you have the unresolved scales you do this and you have the resolved scale and then you couple back to this with the mass fraction. So the, the, the species the momentum equations only see the filtered mass fraction. How you get it is, a, is this model I mean you so you have to do both of them to get this LES LEM coupling. So I will go through some of the steps here. So how do you set it up is very simple because to, from LES all you need is the grid size that because you know, need to know what LES grid size is. So what is the Reynolds number and what is the mass flux balance because mass has to be conserved. Then you go into the subgrid and you run the subgrid processes and this is like the 1D LEM code. And then you have to transport that field and that is this is the tricky part of the model I will go through uh, uh, these two steps because you have to now connect the subgrid stuff because you have you still have to deal with it, it, an equation like this you have to move. So if you go back to the species equation so species equation this is the convective term right this is the most important term in fluid mechanics also. We are breaking it up into two parts one in the subgrid and one in the resolved grid. Notice how it is written as d over dxi of this term but it is not done you do not do a finite difference okay. When you, when you do a finite difference what do you do you take uh, if you have a cell you take uh, yn plus 1 minus yn middle values and divide by delta x and that is a gradient right. But then you are basically creating a gradient diffusion model at the resolved scale. Here what you are doing is that you are taking this field and convecting it. So the subgrid structure whatever you have built in that 1D line is moving around you know from cell to cell to cell. And that is the unique advantage of this model is that 
even though it is a small scale field, the LES field is seeing that small scale field at every time step. And it's, it's, it's seeing it in a structural form. So when you go back to uh, this kind of picture, the, uh, these lines are moving around. Like, I mean, if there's a flux from here to here, a piece of it will go here. So rather than if, if there was a flux in a conventional finite volume scheme, you'll have a point here, a point here. You just take the derivative and you compute the flux. Here we don't do that. You know. You're actually physically moving the subgrid structure around. So that means we are building the subgrid information as we evolve. So I'll show you some examples of that. And uh, uh, so this is how typically what you do. And this is a good way to explain that. That uh, subgrid process is essentially an integration from delta t LES to whatever local time to the next delta t. Till then, you do all this process. So subgrid stirring, that is that turbulent mixing uh, term. You have a diffusion, chemical reaction, and a source term. So each of them have their own time step. So it's a multi-time scale problem. So between LES time, you stir depending on the time scale. The diffusion time depends on the derivative in the time step restriction on this part and the reaction kinetics. And similarly, the same thing with uh, uh, temperature equation and uh, uh, in, and the main difference here is that because the grid line is very refined, we don't have to do any closures. You know, we can use a species as it is. There's no closure for reaction rate. That's the main advantage. You remember in all the other models, uh, reaction rate closure is essential. Here there's no closure. You actually take the chemistry, stick it in. You know, and this turbulent mixing gives you the reaction rate. Uh, so. Um, so, the, so typically that's what it does. If you have, what does the stirring do? So this term that I was mentioning, that is essentially a representation of a, a term like this, based on the unresolved, what you're doing is that you're allowing the fluid to stir. Like you have an 80, 80 wrinkles. Like you have a, let's say you have a scalar gradient. This is a subgrid line. Let's say it's a 1D line. The scalar gradient looks like that. You have an 80. A turbulent eddy that has instantaneously attached, attacks this, like a rotator, this structure. So if you think about this, this now becomes like that, like the eddy has turned over, you know. So, so what it is doing is called the triplet map and looks like something like this. So it's a single scalar eddy. So size of the eddy is this and this is what happens. So this, it does, it does a triple compression. So if you think about anybody's doing DNS and you look at a turbulent eddy or a scalar field, after a, a, a vortex has turned around, you'll see that the scalar gradient is becoming compressed, and uh, uh, you know you can and you can see that it, initially it was like this. The length of the scalar field is this. Now it has gone up. There's, so the AD has stretched the flame. Interfacial area is going up. That's what turbulent ADs do. They keep increasing. Huh? Uh, we, we base it on Reynolds number and assuming Kolmogorov scaling, I'll show you that. Yeah, the whole thing assumes it's isotropic in the subgrid. So given, an, a, a, let's say you have a Reynolds number of 100,000 and you, your LDS grid is certain thing, then you know how, how many, Kolmo, what is the Kolmogorov size. So you have a range of 80s between the grid size and the Kolmogorov size and that gives you the terminus. So this, those are all set from Kolmogorov theory and that's a good thing. You can't touch it. It's all frozen, frozen in time. You know, in other words, frozen by physics. So here's an example of another AD. You basically, this is what it does. You take these ADs and does a triple map, and it, it can be shown. There are papers out there that, in the limit of pure turbulence, this produces the turbulent diffusivity. The turbulent diffusion model is it matches the exact solution of DNS. Uh, uh, so, uh, so typically. You know, different eddies will take place, and so here is how it does it. Uh, to do this eddy, you need three things. You need to know the Reynolds number, you need to know the size of the eddy, and you need to know when to when to do it. Right? I mean, the eddies don't come. Each each eddy is there's a range of eddies occurring, like say uh, between the grid size and the Kolmogorov scale. How do you implement it? So it got three parameters. First, you have to find the eddy size. What what eddy? Let's say you have you gonna you wanna stir. You have to pick an eddy size. You don't randomly pick it. You, well, you randomly pick it, but you pick it based on the fact that uh, 
the AD side has to lie between the Kolmogorov scale and the grid side. This L is like the grid filter. That's all you have. And, and so once you've given the Reynolds number, right, if you know the Reynolds number, we know this classical scaling. This is a, uh, uh, a param constant parameter that is around 10. Uh, uh, this is eta over L. This is the classical turbulence scaling, like Reynolds. Kolmogorov scale over the length, integral length scale goes as Reynolds to the power of 3 fourths. Everybody knows that, right? So, so now instead of the integral length scale, we use the grid size here. So this, given the Reynolds number and given the grid size, you can find the Kolmogorov scale. And given the Kolmogorov scale, you can build a PDF of grid sizes that range from eta to the grid Kolmogorov. And this comes purely from Kolmogorov theory. This is not my invention or anyone's invention. It is, it is always there, you know, it's, it's a fixed quantity. And then you have to say, well, how long, how many times does it happen? Again, Kolmogorov theory tells you as ADs become smaller and smaller, the frequency goes up. I mean, it's again, Kolmogorov theory tells you this. Uh, so the time step for stirring, delta T stir, is in, in, inverse of the, uh, the frequency. Again, as you can see from this function of Reynolds number, there's a viscosity effect. Uh, and this L over eta showing up. There is one constant in this one that has to be tuned. And again, that is tuned based on turbulent scaling, not from combustion. So all these things that I'm showing you is only uh, turbulent physics. And it's based on Kolmogorov theory. So obviously, if Kolmogorov theory is wrong, this is why I was talking about in the last class, that uh, we have to assume that Kolmogorov hypothesis is still valid. You know, now, if it is changed, we can change these, but we don't know how to change it. Right, which is why we hold it fixed. So there are two parameters in this system. One is N, that is the scaling law for Kolmogorov to 80, that is typically based on DNS is around three to, between 3 to 10. And this one, which actually we can mathematically predict based on theory. And, and I'll show you the number in a minute. And so once we know the AD size distribution and the frequency, uh, let's say your delta T LES is 10 to minus 5. And, you, and the Reynolds number is so high that delta T stir is 10 to minus 6. So that means there has to be 10 ADs between two LES time steps, right? That's because it's one time, 10 times smaller, so there will be 10 ADs. So each time it's a different AD size, and that AD size has to stay within the range of the grid to the Kolmogorov scale. So you randomly, you're based on the time, you pick a AD size. Then you randomly locate it in the subgrid domain and let it stir, do the stirring that I was showing you. Next time you take another random location and you stir. So ADs after ADs will interact and you start getting wrinkling at the small scale. You start get turbulent wrinkling, which is essential to the subgrid model. That's what we're talking about. But all these parameters are coming from fluid mechanics, not from combustion. So that's the, so I mean, here's some couple of examples. Uh, how it is done, there are a lot of papers on it. I'll, you know, it maps, and typically the idea is that an AD size, is, AD has to be a minimum six grid points in order to get this triple map, you know, this kind of mapping, you know, this kind of mapping. You know, if you do anything less than that, you get numerical thing. It should be actually, if it is a lot of points in there, so if you have an AD, uh, if you have, let's say, 100 points in the LEM domain, then all multiples of nine or six will be an AD size. So 96 will be an AD of 96 will be the largest AD, and AD of 6 will be the smallest AD. So you can actually make it resolve the Kolmogorov scale or the bachelor scale depending on the resolution you put it. You know. Typically, we run about 24 cells in every LES cell because that's computationally. Uh, so to, and to be exactly accurate, it has to be of multiples of nine. Again, that's just to, just to allow you to. So example, if you had a uh, so if, if you have a 12 cells in the LEM domain, the only ADs you're allowed is 6, 9, and 12, multiples of 3, you know, because the compression that we are modeling has to be th divided by 3. You know. so that's just a mathematical, and, and, and uh, that allows you to get the, uh, the turbulent diffusivity. So here are some examples of the, the, the stirring model. It's only like a few lines. You know. It's not that complicated, you know. Uh, uh, and typically, this is what it does. For example, here's the Reynolds number 50. There's the Reynolds number 100, Reynolds number 200. And you can see from that, as the Reynolds number increases, the probability of the AD being smaller becomes larger. 
higher the Reynolds number, the most common AD is the smallest. That's classical Kolmogorov thing. So lower the Reynolds number, the ADs can be much long, larger. Uh, you can have some larger, possibly the larger ADs, but as you go to very high Reynolds numbers, uh, this, by the way, this is a subgrid Reynolds number. This is not, this is based on grid size and the subgrid turbulence. So this is actually a very high Reynolds number, okay? This is not the Reynolds number based on the jet diameter or something. This is the, this is based on U prime times the grid size over the viscosity. So it's a, it, this for it to be 200, the, the Reynolds number could be 100,000 on the, in the jet, for example. So again, you know, if you're, you know, if Reynolds number, you know, you have 24 ADs versus 96 ADs. If 24 points, you have these many ADs. If you have 96 points, you get this kind of distribution. And this is all coming from Kolmogorov, that F of L distribution. So this is just to show you what that sensitivity of the function is. And uh, typically that is what you do. You take the Reynolds number, you find the Kolmogorov scale, you find the stirring frequencies, and uh, essentially, and this is actually a constant. In other words, the C lambda that I mentioned is a constant because, uh, because this actually can be mathematically proven to be from theory. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip through some of these. These are only, this is what I was mentioned. These are the codes that I've given you uh, uh, and uh, uh, and you can kind of correlate that to the word wording here. As it is like a uh, explaining the and here is the AD size dis distribution function that you're picking up. And so, given any time you pick an AD, you do the mapping and the mapping and 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 then you move on. So I'll let you go through that. This is the mapping cycle. The mapping is actually a this is all the map. The entire stirring triplet map is only six lines of code. No, it's only six lines of code. You know, it's a, and uh, so because it, it doesn't, it, what it does is a very simple thing. So here's an example of what it does. I'll, I'll let you look at the code later. Uh, let's say there are six grid points, and I'm coloring it differently to show what it is. And let's say you have an 80 of six 80, size 80 that is gonna, this is all, you can imagine this as a scalar, species gradient. Now you have an 80 of six size, that's gonna mix it up. So how do you mix it up? Uh, it, it does it in three steps. It takes the every other point, stores it temporarily, and then flips it in that form. That's all it does. Yeah. So the scalar value, magnitude, species, mass fractions are not touched. The location of the mass fraction has changed. So the, the mapping is just making this, the AD create a gradient in the scalar. So you know, initially the scalar gradient was like that. Now you can see the scalar gradient has gone up, has gone down and gone up, you know, because you now you can imagine there was an 80 that turned it in that direction to do that. So typically this is what happens. Now you have a premix flame, this is a premix flame propagating, it is hydrogen, this is a radical, it's not uh, the fuel, and you and it is evolving in time, the flame is sitting there and wrinkling. And these are eddies that are happening. You can see every once in a while you see a bunch of eddies interacting and the flame is propagating and growing. Uh, uh, so this is like a freely propagating, pre like a premix type of flame. It's actually a methane air flame. So H is a radical. It's coming out from, a, we are doing a multi-step chemistry in here. Now the other point was that this stirring process that I mentioned does not happen all by itself because that's only the turbulence part. The subgrid model has three pieces, right? It has uh, molecular mixing, molecular diffusion, turbulent mixing. That is this one. This was turbulent mixing only. Uh, uh, but it also has diffusion, and then you have reaction rate, reaction. So these three are three time steps, time features that are competing with each other. So for example, here's an example of a case where uh, this, this, the H mass fraction the red dotted line is when there is no diffusion, only turbulent mixing. So you can see it's wrinkling and creating all these sharp fronts. Now, diffusion will smooth it up, right? Diffusion, anytime you have a gradient, diffusion wants to destroy the gradient. That's what diffusion does. So you can see that uh, after this stirring, if diffusion takes over, you can see some of these guys are wiped out. The, the solution has changed a little bit from a uniform solution. Uh, in some cases, is this one again, another example of another radical. We're showing radicals here, so those are important to look at. You know. 
Let me repeat. So here is an, another example of a methane frame looking. It's a methane air flame, so hydrogen is a radical, so that's why it peaks in the middle of the flame. Uh, you can see here, the initially the data, the black points are the initial data, it's smooth curve, and you stirred it uh, based on turbulence stirring. So you have an eddy here, an eddy here, an eddy here of different sizes, so it's creating gradients now. Now if you look carefully, I'm going to turn on diffusion, uh, so that eddies have destroyed. So once the diffusion came, some of those gradients got weakened and you can see that some of it is wiped out. So this is what it's doing, it, a mapping, a turbulent stirring mix, sharp gradient, a, a single diffusion event will destroy this part. You let it diffuse more, eventually everything will come back to the original point, right? All the, all the gradient will wipe out. So this is with diffusion turned on and now if you turn on reactions, where will it react? You, you most likely it's going to react in regions where there are sharp gradients. So the reactions now compete with diffusion and stirring in a consistent manner. The interesting thing about this model is that you can write a underlying code for a scalar, simple scalar model, and simulate it with this problem and you can actually predict the, the, the Obukov Corizin spectrum, which is the scalar spectrum, like Kolmogorov predicted the turbulence spectrum uh, uh, Obukov and Corizin predicted the scalar spectrum and it has a certain pack measure and based on that there's a paper by Sakurvarti and Menon a long time ago where we actually showed that we can match the experimental values and also predict the, the Corizin spectrum, the spectrum, the coefficient of the spectrum. Like Kolmogorov spectrum has a coefficient if you remember 2.5 or you know the C in the coefficient in front. Similarly, there's a coefficient beta for the Obukov Corizin constant uh, that you know, that has been predicted in the, by from experiments and lots of other studies to write in that range. We predict around 442, and you can see we are recovering the coefficient, the spectrum. And what is more interesting about this is that uh, this is one of the tests that very few models can predict. If you had a problem with Schmidt number much less than one. Uh, like Schmidt number is around one for fluid mechanics, but very less than one or very large one. Uh, fluid mechanics, uh, classical experiments and uh, old famous people have done, they have shown that the spectrums will change. The, the spec scalar spectrum will change. These are well known classical things. Uh, people have predicted these spectrums using tweaked models or DNS. But this is just a 1D line. This is like 100 lines of code that is predicting the, the changes in spectrum. And this is, the, this is that constant that I was talking about. And, uh, and you know, it, it, you can show that this, it actually predicts the scalar dissipation quite accurately, you know. So, so the, the, these studies actually provided us with the constants that we need to close the linearity model. And that's what, uh, that's, that's the main, uh, uh, that's, so once that model, this again, some turbulence, Turbulent mixing of scalars, nothing to do with combustion because all, these are all fluid mechanical requirements which is why I said in the beginning of the lectures that if you don't do turbulence correctly, you can't do combustion. You got to do these things correct first. Once you have these, you have to hope that this is correct that in the sense that Kolmogorov theory is correct or hypothesis is valid because if it is valid, then you can use it and that's what we do. We, we assume we have matched these results with the code. And basically we say, okay, that's the parameters we're going to use for all combustion, premix, non-premix, sprays, detonation, whatever you want to do. We're not going to touch these constants because these are fluid mechanical constants. We don't want to, we don't, we don't want to modify, you know. So let's say we take that model and now actually do some flames. I'll give you some examples of what the flames do. So here's a, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this kind of, this is called the Borghi diagram. So here is a corrugated flamelet regime, maybe Foreman Williams talked about it. Essentially the idea is that as the turbulence goes up, uh, here's the laminar side, you know, your flame starts to wrinkle, then it, the wrinkling goes up, and as you go to thin reaction zone, the, the AD sizes, uh, as turbulence goes up, what happens? The Kolmogorov scale becomes smaller and smaller, right? So if you, for a given flame, if the Kolmogorov AD becomes smaller and smaller, eventually it will start becoming smaller than the flame thickness, the laminar flame thickness. So it starts penetrating into the preheat zone, in, the heat, in, the, in front of the flame. 
So the thin reaction zones are regimes where uh, the flame zone is broadened, but the reactions are still very thin. So reactions are occurring thin, flame has become thick because temperature has become, the heat transfer has gone in front of the front. But a flamelet, the reaction zone and the flame front is very thin and, uh, uh, and, 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 and there's no heat transfer in the front. And once you go to broken zones, essentially the, the reaction zone is also broadened and actually the flame loses structure. So this premix problem. So here we did some experiments, uh, simulations. Some of them was experiment, the E stands for experiments. Uh, uh, and there's a laminar, unstretched laminar flame speed. This is a turbulence U prime over SL is telling you, for example, in this case, uh, the turbulence is, fluctuation is 200 times than the flame speed. You know, very high turbulence. And you can see from this Reynolds, turbulent Reynolds numbers are 2300, Carl Lewis number is very high. You can see this is a Carl Lewis number one, and there is another larger value of 100 or something out here. So the question is, can you take one model, don't touch anything, you know, in the combustion side, uh, all you do is change the turbulence, crank up the turbulence, go from different Reynolds number, will, will, you, will you be able to go from here to there? And if you go from here to there, the flame structure should change. And because people have seen that, and the question is, will the model predict that too? And there's a paper that was published recently that has more details. I'm just showing a few things. So here is Carl Lewis number one. This is the dots are experiments. Uh, uh, and you can, uh, it's more like a flamelet. You know, it's a very thin flame. So this is plotting temperature over distance. This is showing the laminar value and the mean of the turbulent value, there is some endpoints end effects. But as you go to a larger Karlovich number, uh, this is going from 37 to 1193, you can see that it is broadening, flame is broadening, and the difference between the laminar solution and the mean uh, is of the turbulent flame speed shape is quite different. Now, more importantly, the mean generally speaks, uh, 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 see the dotted line is a time average temperature gradient. So you, this is the, one of the things you have to keep worrying about in turbulent flows is that this line has nothing to do with, doesn't, this is an average of this whole line, this whole region, but it obviously doesn't have the, it just is a representation, it is not real. That dotted line doesn't exist. You know, that's an average that you're computing, but you can see from this, as Carlos number goes up, the flame is broadening, that means it's getting hotter in front of the, uh, uh, in front of the flame. So in a typical problem, what happens is if you have a hydrocarbon, methane or higher hydrocarbon, temperature goes up in front of the flame to seven, 800 degrees, the fuel start to crack. It won't react yet, it'll start breaking up. So you get preheat zone actually has some kind of reactions going on because heat transfer is spreading in front of the flame. So the, uh, the very high Reynolds number problems are very difficult to model because you can see from this picture that uh, it's no longer a flamelet. Anything like this is no longer a flamelet because a flamelet assumes it's a thin flame. So if the flamelet model holds here, it may hold here a little bit because, but you can see there's already changes, but by the time you go to much higher Carlovich number, the flamelet models start to fail. You know, so if you did a flamelet solution, you'll get an answer there, but it may be a completely wrong answer. You know, that's, that's the point. You know. Because the regime stain, the regime structure has a different phenomena in here. Here's another way to look at it. Uh, this is a Karlovich number one, phi of one. This is the plotting the temperature and the reaction rate. So you can see the temperature is a sharp front. Reaction rate is also thin. That's like classical flamelet. You know, this one now is going into 37. You can see the reaction front is still thin, but you're starting to get some action in front. So you're starting to break the flamelet assumption as you go to a color is number 30, 37 or around greater than one. There's a preheat zone is broadening. When you go very high, you start seeing it's very broadened. Notice that it is the, the reaction front reaction rate is also broadened, not thin anymore. So so even if you can do a flamelet model for thin reaction zones by only focusing on the reaction zone. Uh, you cannot use it for much higher values. It starts to fail. Now, the reason why this, this is obviously a lab experiment, obviously that's it is, 
But in a real combustor, like a big premixed gas turbine, I'll show some results. Um, this happens all over the place. You'll have some region where Carlow's number is one. Right next to it, you'll have Carlow's number of thousand. You know? So in a real combustor, premixed combustor, uh, Carlow's numbers or the flame um, turbulence interactions it ranges over a wide range that you cannot assume that is always flameless. You cannot also assume it is always thin broken zone either. I mean, it's a combination. So the point here is that uh, uh, right now a model that works here, flamelet models cannot handle that. You know, right now there's no models like that. PDF methods may be able to attempt, but this model actually goes from one regime to the other without doing anything. We haven't done anything to the model. The model has been frozen. You know, we just change the Reynolds number, which is what happens in a combustor. Different regimes, different regions of the combustor. You have different, uh, uh, okay, let me, uh, mm -hmm. Well, in, in the flamelet models, you don't really resolve the flame. You know, it's based on the mixture fraction, right? I mean, so when it mix, it's all, in the actual flamelet models and flamelet methods, you solve for the mixture fraction and you get the flame surface. And they usually plot the temperature or something based on, on progress variables space. So that yeah, the, the flamelets are all laminar flame library. There's no turbulent flame. The turbulent flame is the closure on the mixture fraction. You, have a, you solve for a variance or a scalar dissipation. But uh, what goes into the library is all laminar. It's, it's point chemistry. Thin flame, yeah. Right, I mean, you can modify. There are people working on modifying all that things. But generally speaking, as you go further and further here, there is nothing like some, anything thin anymore. So that thin concept is gone, and the laminar concept is gone. You know, so it's already gone here to some extent. You can imagine that the reaction zone is thin and we can keep going, but it's still not valid. Uh, let me finish one more point on this one is that one interesting thing that we found, which is, makes sense, that uh, as we go to lower and lower Karlovic numbers, even as the, the flamelet is, model is failing, we also find that we are running generalized Lewis number. And this dotted line is Lewis mixture, laminar solution, Lewis number one solution. You can see that uh, um, um, molecular diffusion is, has a tremendous role because it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy Lewis number one. But as you go to higher and higher Reynolds numbers, and even though it's no longer flamelet, okay, it's no longer flamelet, but it's very high Reynolds numbers, so highly turbulent flames, then laminar diffusion is starting to become insignificant. So here is a very weird thing. The Rance people, you know, in theory, have been running very high Reynolds number flows, assuming molecular diffusion is not important. It actually seems to make sense as long as the flames are in, in, in this thin broken zone regime when it's all mixed up, when its turbulence is very high. But not in, in the regime where it is flamelet. If it is flamelet type regime or low Reynolds number regimes, you find that uh, or, uh, uh, thin low Karlovic number regimes, uh, uh, as, assuming that molecular diffusion can be neglected is actually wrong. So in some sense, that assumption is valid, but in a different regime, which nobody tries. So I mean, so but this model is showing the transition from there. There's a discussion in that paper. So that's kind of an interesting conclusion on that. Uh, so that was the 1D model. That's the subgrid model that sits in there. And I want to go through a little bit on the large scale transport and the details are a little. Uh, so remember, I said these are 1D lines in every cell. You have this 1D line sitting in every cell. Now you still have to connect them, otherwise you don't have any three-dimensional features, right? You've got to get 3D effects into this problem. So you would basically think about this as these cells are moving from cell to cell. Instead of doing a finite difference, which is how you do it in a finite volume, we actually want to move the structure from one cell to the other cell. And it is useful to understand that these cells are moving because of conservation of mass, right? You have mass flux. You've got flux going in, flux going out. So in this particular case, the pink ones show the fluxes that are going out, and one, two, and three are fluxes coming in. So in an average sense, they add up to zero, net flux conservation of mass. So we implement 
this thing is this large scale transport using the something called splicing and uh, you know you think about this as DNA strands if this 1D lines are DNA strands and you want to move some flux some mass has to go from one cell to the other cell what you do is you cut a portion and send it up and you get something from the other side of equal mass you, you splice it back together. So in the net you have that 1D line that is changing wrinkling and moving around in the subgrid but also getting moved around by the large scale. So another way to think about this is that splicing is a structural form of level set method. Now if you are familiar with level sets, you know level sets you move up front like a Lagrangian method. You know, in a, so it is a Lagrangian transport method so and the main point is that it connects the scalar gradient in the subgrid. It does not transfer just a scalar point, it convects the scalar gradient and uh, typically that is what it does. It can actually move a cell, here is a structure, scalar gradient sitting, very complicated scalar gradient and these lines are the LEM 1D line that is just to show you and you, you, it is a very arbitrary scalar gradient. Notice the scalar gradient is not affected at all as it moves. Now if you did a finite difference thing in there, it will get by plot and I will show you that in a minute and you can actually move squares and circles just like a level set. Uh, method, but uh, slightly differently. Now I've got some more details in here for you to look at it. Again, this is the incoming, outgoing. I'm not going to go through. So here's a, some. This is a good example. Here is a some scale of field, and you want to take out some mass. So and you find out that the 20% of the mass from this cell, just to give an example, is going to go out. That means 20% of the cells in the subgrid has to move. So you take 20% of the cells cut it out, you know, it is like a mathematical algorithm, you just take a piece out and send it to the next cell but at the same token due to conservation of mass you might get some other cells coming in. So here these 4, 5 and 6 is taking out these 3 pieces. So you can notice that in what it is taking out it has got the structure in it. The wrinkles are still in there, you are not losing the structures uh, and the same token you will get uh, 3 more different structures coming in from, from the other side, conservation of mass. So flux in and flux out just like the mass conservation does and so in the end you put them together so you will get something like this, you will get a structure that some of it is original and some of it is new. You know, so you can see there are a lot of uh, gradient type behavior in the error and that is a numerical error here. I mean, this is one of the problems with this model is that when you bring these things, you bring in the structures but it comes in with different sizes because the volumes are not fixed. One is 3.6 cells, one is 2.8, could be 1.8. So you get a, a strands, a lot of strands. Now you have to make it a continuous line, so you have to mix them up. You have to rearrange them and that is a numerical. Uh, so basically what you do is you take that and you regrid it and you average. So if you regrid this region, you take the solution and average it and now you get the new solution. So this is after one transport you get a the old one looked something else, this is now a new structure. But wherever you did this regrading, you have created numerical errors. Okay, that is the numerical diffusion in this model. Uh, but uh, and you have to be careful and you have to look for that when you are doing that. And that is a limitation because you do not want, you have got a nice structure and as long as the grid size are big, it would not matter. But if the grid was fine, it would not matter. But if the grid is coarse, like you only have 6 or 10 cells. Uh, uh, again it is a grid issue, finer the grid more accurate it will be but it will be expensive so uh, you have to make a compromise on this and you have to be aware of what it does and in fact I will not skip through this but these are the explanation of that this package. Uh, uh, but here is a good example of what this can do versus what gradient diffusion does. So here I am splicing out one cell at a time so the red, the red line is the original solution that is just to show should have been a very sharp front. So you want to transport a sharp front. In a finite difference, uh, if you did just a finite difference problem, the blue line is what you get. That instead of transporting a square, you are transporting some weird ones and you are leaving things behind. You know? And you can try it yourself, you just take a 0, 1 gradient and do a finite uh, 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 Euler convection, just a the convective transport. While the dotted black line is the splicing. So you can see that it is still messing up somewhere here and here but overall it is tracking 
that sharp front. So you are getting the structure without numerical dissipation in, in a scenario when you do this. But what happens if you splice less number of cells? You know, if you try to do a, a partial cells, uh, um, you can see that we still maintain it. Uh, this is something. Oh yeah, this is something you repeat. Uh, but we can even even when the front is very complicated signal, the red line is very complicated. Uh, you start losing out some of the features, uh, but it is much better than the bl blue line, which is the diffusion. You know. So the point is that it has limitations, and it's, uh, the limitations can be tested and verified. And you can actually get, uh, uh, depending on how much you transfer, you can get much better accuracy. If not. Uh, 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 but the main advantage is that what you are transferring is the built in structure, not a gradient transport. That is the main feature. So, here is another example of what I am transferring a very complicated looking front. So, that this could be all mass fraction. So, it could be a ring filled flame is moving in 1D. Uh, but, like I said, if I do a perfect transfer, it looks good. If you transfer a little bit coarser, you lose some structure. If you transfer a very small amount, you start losing. You know, so there is a numerical aspect to it also, just like any other scheme. But the point is that you know, it can be quantified as to how much you're getting. Like, like I said, if you are to do a diffusion problem, you won't get any of this. It will pretty wipe out. You know, that's the that's the main. You know. So here, you know, and it can be it's, it can be done in 3D. So for example, I want to take this cell and move it that structure and move it there. So you are splicing it in three dimensions. The picture I showed you was in 1D, but now it is in 3D. And you can see that it is moving. It started at here, and then some of it goes there, some of it goes there, some of it goes there, some of it goes there. But in the end, when it comes out there, it is approximately the same. You can show that if you do it properly, you can get the front is moving. And if it is, if you do it with a lot of coarse grid, you start losing the structure. Even if you are getting it, you do not get it. So uh, the, 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 again, the point is that this kind of test is to show the worst of the model. But typically, remember, uh, flame is not going to do that. This, uh, flame is going to sit there and wrinkle, right? It's not moving, you know, very rapidly. So that's what I said. If it is a stationary frame, this problem is not that evident. This is this is like a worst case scenario. This is like a flame ball moving all over the place. That's very it's a very strict test of the model, but it is really not the, the purpose of the model. The model in the flame is designed for models where the flame is anchored and wrinkling where it works fine. So, for example, here is a old place. I think I will stop very shortly. Uh, uh, um, next lecture I will show you more applications. So, here is a stagnation point flame. Here is a flame sitting there. You have turbulent flame, turbulent mix coming in, and the flame is sitting there and wrinkling. And we are doing the linearity model. And But we also ran it with the G equation. And if you look at the experiment comparison in the mean flow, you see that the G equation it looks pretty good. That, that red line is the G equation, which is very simple. You know, it's like factor of five cheaper than LEM, and the LEM looks like that. But when you look at the turbulence, you see where the G equation is messing up. G equation is, uh, you know, in the LES grid, it uses a flame speed model, but uh, experiments show that when the flame is wrinkling like that, you get a lot of flame generated turbulence, and that is picked up by the LEM approach. You know, this, so, that's the, so, these are the kind of subtle features that uh, in the mean it may not show much effect, but in the RMS it shows a much bigger uh, effect. Here is an example of what the model can do if you were doing it in, in uh, LEM, it can be put into DNS just to test it to make sure it does not. Go berserk. If a DNS means that it is all resolved, nothing much is going to go on the subgrid. You can see that the DNS flame is recovered uh, reasonably well. Uh, but this is typically an example of how the model works. So this is a liquid spray. I mean, I just this is just a cart. It's actually a vaporizing acetone spray. These are this is actually the same jet spray. Uh, they're all the same. I'm just showing different size. This is Stokes number. This is different size droplets. They're all on top and it's vaporizing. So if you want to simulate that, and, and we are simulating that with these 1D lines, you can see those 1D lines are moving around every time step. The dots that are not moving is the average value. You take the scenario, sum, sum it, and average it. 
uh, and the average values is what everybody plots, but you can see that average is coming due to a lot of action going on. These lines are moving around. And if you zoom into these three or two or three of these lines, you can see that the because it's a patient is the liquid vaporizing into gas, you can get all this wrinkling. You can see it wrinkling. And actually if you these are not synchronized, but actually when the Reynolds number goes up, you get more wrinkles. That's the idea. The turbulence Turbulence increases, you get more wrinkles. Turbulence dies, the wrinkles go down. Uh, and then you recover the statistics, and in the end, you, you can compare with the experiment. That was the experimental data. And you can see that we can match this experimental data on an average sense. But instantaneously, that's, that, this is the 1D line. Those, this is the linearity line. Each cell has this 24 points or something that are moving around. So that's the point. Now, if you had a flame, in a captured over three LES cells, okay, you say, well, I can't capture a flame over three LES cells. But if I have 24 LEM points in three LES cells, I actually have 72 points on that three LES cell. So it's hidden inside the subgrid, but we actually have a very fine grid. And by making it one dimensional, it allows it to be, you know, it, it allows you to work with. Uh, um, uh, with, with computationally feasible. This, this one is a non premix problem, again a classical problem, it's a, it's a mixing layer. So uh, it's a very high Reynolds number experiments done in Caltech uh, and Stanford. And uh, uh, what the experiment shows is in the core of the mixing layer, everything is mixed up, small scale mixing. This is a classical uh, problem, you know, mix and mix effects. Now, if I did a gradient diffusion model, uh, if it's a purely gradient diffusion, just like a finite volume, you will say there's fuel is here, reactant is there, the mixed region is maximum up here, the middle. You know, typical, you know, if you have A and B and you say where the mixing is, is in the middle. But the LEM shows that the mixing is actually more ramp-like structure, just like in the experiment, because the small scales recover the small scale mixing. So like, this is like showing the uh, what they do as this uh, Caltech experiments, uh, Mungal and Demotakis, uh, uh, shows the flip experiments. Like if you flip the equivalence ratio, the ramp-like structure changes direction uh, based on the which which one is a uh, higher uh, uh, high, higher speed. And uh, this is the right hand side is the experimental structure, the left hand side is the, the LEM structure. Now, if you did a finite volume calculation you'll never get that structure because it's not there. Remember, it's an LES, it's not a DNS. In a DNS, you might, but in the LES, you don't, you will never get that structure in the subgrid level because it is not there, it doesn't exist. In the LEM approach, it does exist, so you can actually recover that and use it for the program. So the same model, the same model was used for premix and non-premix without any changes except for conditions and here. What I'm trying to show is that the features in it is, is there to allow you to capture the missing information, but as it is an approximation. There are some errors and there are some approximations that you have to worry about. Uh, I think I'll stop here on this lecture and then I'll show some applications in the next class. So if you have any questions, I can, yeah. Oh, this one. This is a Lagrangian spray. This is in Lagrangian LES. Yeah, this is, with, with this, I'll talk about some of the spray stuff in the last lecture, but so this is acetone spray. This is vaporizing and it's forming ga gas. You know, now it's an experiment done at uh, uh, at Sydney by Masri's group. Like, in, yeah. No, we are solving it as a two-step, and in the so the two-step equation, the subgrid process and the splicing together gives you the species conservation. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. In, in the mass has to be that flux split, flux mass ensures the mass is always conserved. You, you have to mention ensure that, otherwise you'll get into you know. So it depends on the local Reynolds number, and you know, typically in compressible code, your LES time sets are very small, so it doesn't have a problem. But if you're doing low mass number code, then you may have a lot of subgrid. They're independent time steps. So, but it only evolves up to the next LES time. It evolves up to the next LES time. So every LES time it is synchronized. So the global field is evolving at uh, LES time and the LEM could be evolving a few more times depending on the problem. So if it's 
Yeah, it's a, yeah, for the subgrid, it's, it's uh, somewhere between, oops, between, yeah, in, in, that's right. It is still, a, it's a, you know, if without combustion, it is about two times, three times more expensive, you know, from a, for the same grid LES. But the point is that typically when you do LES, you won't do that course. You will do a very fine grid LES. So it becomes equivalent to a fine grid LES, you know. But with chemistry, the cost of chemistry takes over. You know, that's true for everything, you know. Yeah. So is uh, LEM LES a provably consistent approach? As in, like when you use a high number of LEM cells, you recover the analytical solution. Yeah, the higher the number of LEM, more lesser the errors, the diffusion and the regrading. Those th problems go away. You know, it's just that as you put more and more LEM cells in a full 3D combustor, the cost will go up. So uh, it is it is more expensive than a conventional LES. Uh, on the same grid, but if you were to do, say, take the LES to be eight times more, then the cost becomes equivalent. But if you wanted to get a DNS type resolution, then you have to go very high resolution. Then you're back to the DNS cost. So the, the choice of the number of grids you use in the LEM is kind of dictated by, by what you can afford. You know? but, you, but it is designed to achieve DNS limit. Uh, but like I said, it cannot do the laminar problem. It has a problem doing laminar because not designed for laminar. It needs all the wrinkling to forget. And like I said, that splicing thing that I showed, that is a rare scenario. In, you know, that's that's the worst case scenario. That is telling you this is the kind of problems where it will fail because you don't it won't work. But typically, when a flame is sitting like that and wrinkling like this, like this kind of picture, it does a good job because it's not it doesn't in, in the flame is not moving very rapidly. You know, so higher the cells, more accurate it is. I actually have a follow-up. So, uh, so you said that it doesn't handle the laminar case very well, but even for the turbulent case, you mentioned one of the drawbacks was not being able to capture frame link wrinkling accurately. No, in wrinkling it will get, as, but if the wrinkling is very close to laminar, like low car, low Reynolds yeah. number problems, then it it will do something, but it will be in, more inaccurate. Yeah, that that is because like uh, when you're using the flame crossings to estimate the radius right. of curvature. If, not only that, when there is no stirring, this whole subgrid approach becomes very, very line dependent, shape dependent, you know, and that it cannot handle. If it's a pure 1D problem, it can do that, but if it's a 3D problem and it's doing like this, then there's nothing much happening in the subgrid, you know. So we need the stirring to recover statistics. So it gets better only at higher Reynolds number. So it is actually good for LES of combustors because it's always at high Reynolds number. But sometimes some lab flames are very low Reynolds numbers that very have trouble. Yeah. yeah. Well, the droplet is tracked as a Lagrangian droplet, but the source term, when it vaporizes, it shows up in the LEM equation, like the source term. So its phase changes in the subgrid, but the Lagrangian tracking is separate LES. Not done that. Yeah, I mean, you can do it for real gas, you know, stiffen gas. Uh, how, you does, how does it compare in accuracy? Uh, stiffen gas typically is used for volume of fluid type, two fluid formulation. Here, the Lagrangian is considered point particle. So, you're not worried, we're not doing any stiffen gas, you know. So, uh, we haven't tried, compared it with liquid droplet breakup, you know, the break the breakup scenario that requires a diffused interface. This is a compressible code, yeah, so we are not, we're not doing that. So Lagrangian oil in the spray models are all point particle models. You, know. you have a dense correction I'll talk about tomorrow, but you're not really doing anything fundamental about the spray because that's a unsolved problem in itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like that the solution experiments are showing. There's no proof, no experimental verification on this. It's a prediction. But it is saying, it seems to suggest that as you go to higher and higher Reynolds numbers, uh, uh, the, and it becomes broadened, the flame structure is getting broadened, it's, there is no flame. It's all mixed up, you know. It's like a broken zone called the broken reaction zone. And that regime, turbulence is dominating, like a perfectly stirred reactor, you know. As yet, approaches the perfectly stirred reactor, doesn't matter, diffusion doesn't have any time. 
That's right. It, it is there, but it, is, it, it does not seem to control that much. So in other words, the Lewis number one approximation when we do a, a very high Reynolds number broken zone regime might be okay. But people use that for low Reynolds number right now. That's, that's what I'm saying. So at the low Reynolds number, there's a big difference. You know? so, so nobody really does the Reynolds numbers of Carlowitz numbers of 1,000. You know, that's almost impossible. You know, uh, experimentally, nobody has measured anything in there. You know? so, but so, that, so for example, uh, things like homogeneous charge compression charge ignition system like uh, diesel or something but it's very highly turbulent there is really no diffusional effects it's all turbulent you know auto ignition is all controlled by small scale turbulence you know so there there you may not need a differential diffusion you know but the low Reynolds numbers are low and it seems to be more important you know but the, right now people are not using the, those kind of models for low Reynolds numbers so, so there's an error the ratio of the uh, subgrid scales to the I mean, the number of uh, subgrid scales for each LES scale mm -hmm. uh, was it kept constant? For yeah, that is again a programming. I forgot to mention. What we do is find out the worst case scenario and use it everywhere. So, for example, we have a 24 points here. We have 24 points here. Nothing is going on there, but it's just sitting there doing it. But they, that because it's a parallel code, you know, it makes it easier to make the cells the same. That is why we have to do regrading. If we can come up with a good algorithm to do a variable linear uh, model, that will be more efficient. You know. uh, how does the computational expense scales with the ratio of the subgrid scales? Uh, like per, uh, typically, like, let's say if we use 24 cells in every LES cell, it is a factor of two to three more expensive. Like let's say if your LES grid was a million grid points, and I had 24 LEM cells in each of the million grid points, then the cost will be about three times because of because it's a parallel code. It becomes more efficient in parallel. You know, you know it scales up more well in parallel. But if you go to hundred or something, it'll become five to ten times more expensive. So the but but the, so that's why I was saying the choice of the grid is kind of balanced between what you can afford. You know, like we ran between twelve to twenty four cells. You know, which seems to be reasonable. You know. Uh, because the reason is that the LES grid is also not small. So we already have five, ten million points in the LES side also. You know. Now, if you were to do an LES of this problem using conventional filtering, then you may have to have a grid like, uh, let's instead of five million LES cells and twenty-four LEM points, you might need fifty million grid points for LES. If you if you are doing a flamelet type problem, you know. So the cost is. When I say it's three to five times more expensive, I'm comparing it on the same grid. But typical people who do LES, conventional LES, will not run such a coarse grid. They will run much finer grid, right? So we actually run a coarse LES because the subgrid model takes care of a lot of this. So if I turn off the subgrid model, it's about five times faster, you know, three to five you know, for that same grid. But my point is that if you were trying to do LES of this problem, you probably run a grid that is eight times more finer to recover it on a finite volume cell. So then it becomes equivalent. Because I mean, I was worried because the at subgrid scales you are solving for species, right? Species right. which is computationally expensive. Well, species itself is not computing because the number of species. If you have like thirty species, you have about thirty equations in there. It's the chemistry that gets it more expensive. So you have to do implicit chemistry, and you know, the chemistry is a killer anywhere. In all codes, if you're doing finite rate, that's why flamelet people are people use flamelets a lot because the chemistry is offline, right? There's no chemistry cost. So we have actually used, uh, like I was showing, we have actually used the G equation in the subgrid. We can use the flamelet equation in the subgrid too. Actually, we did that a long time ago, but there is no gain for that. You know, so this this is. This one with the, with the chemistry, like for example, we are now putting linearity model into GPUs with detailed chemistry. So the advantage is that uh, because it's a parallel nature, each cell does its own work, right? So if you can scale it and put it into a GPU, then the chemistry cost is high, but it will run faster. You know? So the chemistry is, it always will be killer, but the scalers by themselves are around even running 15 scalers is about maybe five times faster, slower, three to five times slower. It's all vectorized, inner loop 
Uh, this is just to get an idea regarding how expensive it is. But uh, com like for given develop accuracy, how does it compare to a PDF based method? Uh, yeah, so for uh, I'll show some results in the in the next few like next next lecture. Uh, it, it does a pretty good job with a coarser grid. In other words, that's why even though it looks expensive on a point to point, when I look at my these predictions against somebody else's LES, they're running much finer grid to get qualitatively same answer. So their cost is actually higher than mine, effective runtime cost. Even though on my basis, if I from an LES to the LEM LES, it's already five times more expensive, but nobody will do an LES with that grid because it won't work. Now, claimlet models will require very fine grid. So we don't run very fine grid because the model handles most of the physics. So this is one case where higher the Reynolds number and coarser the grid, it becomes better. It's more accurate. It's, it's, it's the opposite of most models where other models get better with finer grid. We, here, you don't want a fine grid. If this grid, LES grid was close to DNS, LEM will fail because it cannot do any of this. It doesn't know anything. It has to have that turbulence in the subgrid to do some action. If it says no turbulence, it's dead. It basically doesn't work. So in these regions, it's actually not working. It's not doing anything, but it's just chugging along, producing the same answer. You know, there's only one species. There's nothing going on. You know, but uh, but that is again like if I were to do it properly, I would put only LEM in this region. And don't do LEM in here, but that requires a lot of dynamic load balancing, it's a lot of computer science stuff, programming stuff, which nowadays students don't seem to know anything. So, so we don't do anything. The parallel implementation, you put the same load everywhere and assume it's then it becomes trivially balanced. So that's a, but spray actually doesn't get balanced by the way. We'll talk about that later on because spray will increase the load here, you know, because you have the Lagrangian particles have extra cost. That uh, we cannot. Uh, that's a separate issue. That has nothing to do with LEM. You know. So, so. But anyway, this is. I'll show some examples in the next lectures for gas phase combustion, and then uh, next tomorrow I'll show the spray work. You know.